how did you end up here? What happened? <laughs> Okay, so the, 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 the short story is I studied design at um, degree level. I was never going to make it as an architectural designer, but I was good at writing. And then eventually I fell into architecture journalism. I worked on a few uh, industry magazines. And then I um, got a lucky break to launch a magazine called Icon, like a glossy print magazine. And I was there for about almost three years, and then I got fired for some like ridiculous non-scandal. So when I lost my job, I thought, why don't I start a design blog? Maybe I can make a big impact. And it just kind of took off. It just, um, more and more people just discovered it and um, talked about it and sent me stories. And um, yeah, that's, that's how it happened. It's been growing ever since for 11 years. So what do you think, what advantages do you have in online journalism that print cannot offer? Of course, speed is the, is the, the, the most obvious one. Um, but of course, then the scale of audience with the internet, you can reach people all around the world, whereas print titles are kind of, because they're physical things, they're, they're restricted to the distribution network. I mean, I've always thought of the internet as, for, in terms of a journalist, uh, as a, a, a way more efficient distribution network than existed before. So are you the enemy of print? No, not at all, no. Um, I love magazines, and I think that uh, magazines have had to change, but now there's a resurgence of, of print magazines. But I think the way I saw it 11 years ago when I started journalism was that the internet was where the action was. It wasn't that print was dead, it just it wasn't evolving. So how can you keep a high quality of, like a high level of quality in such a fast-paced medium? Well, I don't agree that the internet is all about speed and shallowness. I mean, of course, we've, you know, we've seen, oh, it's particularly over the last few years, the rise of sort of clickbait and um, fake news and um, sensationalism. But I mean, all of that existed before. So, I mean, we don't worry about it, to be honest. We, we, we specialize, we have a very strong proposition, which is to present architecture and design projects in a beautiful way online, because the screen is a great luminous um, canvas for for images, so that that's another thing that's that's better on the internet in some ways than than paper. Projects look amazing, and to support that with writing that's fair and honest and incisive and not too PR-y. Do you think the media today is more a platform for information rather than just a producer of information? Well, I think the internet definitely makes it easier to have a two-way conversation rather than a one-way conversation. I mean. On print magazines, all of the print magazines I worked on had a letters page, and you would really desperately check the mailbox every morning, like, are there any letters? Um, but then when I launched a zine, and we had this comments section at the bottom, and people would actually write comments, and it was really amazing. And, and a lot of them were nonsense, and a lot of them were people just you know trolling each other. But quite often, you'd get really insightful comments that would really add something to the story or link to something that you didn't know about that gave you a whole sort of rabbit hole of, of, of new information possibilities based on that story. Where do you set the line between architecture and design? I really don't see them as different things. I think that's partly because um, when I, I studied design, but I was also interested in architecture. So even though they are sort of, to a large extent, separate worlds, you know, you go to an architecture conference or you go to a design conference, I think the sensibilities are very, very similar. And they're both three-dimensional, and they're both um, uh, produced by people that are similar in their outlooks, I think. Sort of how much power or influence does the media have in the world of architecture? I think it has a substantial influence. Um, magazines have always been arbiters of taste. They've always been the gatekeepers of the information that gets out. Um, and so we, we, we do have a responsibility and we do have an influence. We've changed the design and architecture worlds definitely by making them more connected and international. I mean, that's something that all architects say to me. So we've actually really helped make the world into a kind of level playing field in terms of architecture and design culture. And were you ever planning, like, was your initial idea that the zine would end up like this? Or what was your initial idea when you started the zine? Um, so, first of all, my initial idea was that 
I was going to work for myself and not for someone else. And I was going to have my own platform. And I very much remember thinking that I wanted to build a brand. And I remember telling myself, I think I can build a global brand in one year, which was a really naive statement because I didn't really know what that meant. But I, I just knew that it would be quicker doing it that way than with print. And in fact, I think we managed to build a global brand in less than a year. I think it happened pretty quickly, I think within six months. And how do you decide on what to cover? We're looking for things that are contemporary or avant-garde, so things that are of our time or pointing towards the future. It's important to us that they're beautiful. Sometimes it's important to us that they're ugly because that's also the flip side of, you know, like uh, the, the, the beauty story is like um, provoking people with things that they feel uncomfortable with. And ideally with some kind of story to it. Bizine? What does it mean? Why is it called Bizine? Well, I was looking for a domain name that suggested design magazine. And Dizine was the closest I could get to that. And I thought everyone would understand, like, Zine is a magazine, de design. But nobody got it and everyone asked the question. So what advice do you have for young people that feel the same way you felt back then and they want to do something? You have to get experience. You have to do stuff. It's really important that you you build a story, you build a CV. And, you know, um, I wasn't at all idealistic when I started out. I was just like, I want to, I want to, I, I did, I did anything that people would let me do. I worked in a bar, I worked in a shop. And all the time, though, all the time, though, like suggesting ideas and trying things out. So I, I always was, um, I always was sort of trying to, do more at each place I was working at than I was supposed to under my job description.